Well, I don't know about you guys, but I've sure had fun here so far. I mean, there's lots of good presentations, lots of good networking going on, and that's what this is all about, of uh, trying to stay in, in business in this uh, ranching and farming uh, endeavor that we're all in, or, or support groups like many of the uh, agencies and things are here today. <coughs> Just a little bit about what I'm gonna to try to do here today. I got asked, <clears throat> you know, usually I talk a lot about grazing and building soil health and all that and cover crops. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, Jay Fear and I were asked to come down to Sundance, Wyoming, and put on a couple of presentations and they wanted to hear my top 10 reasons or top 10 ideas for profitability in the cattle business with everything we do. And so I had to think about that a while and kind of put together some things. I've refined it a bit and I'm actually going to present this at the national grazing deal and, and add some more to it to get more in depth into it. But it'll be a snapshot idea of some things that work for us. I mean, they may not work for you, but it stage sure changed our operation around and I'll try to go through those and in this next half hour here and uh, explain them a bit. Just a little bit of history. <coughs> I've been on the ranch since uh, I got out of NDSU way back when now. John and Ray. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Time, time flies by. but <clears throat> And that was a great experience and, and uh, learned a lot of things. But <clears throat> came back to the ranch and our place was started in 1882 by my great-great-grandfather great, great or great-grandfather. I'll get this right yet. Anyway, you stand in front of the sod house and I, I always tell the story, you know, as crappy as it gets out there on that ranch, I, I don't think I have any idea how it was to live in a sod house and put food on the table or stay warm, especially in the northern plains. So I have a lot of appreciation for that. And so we went from that, and this is just as you come into our place, uh, and we're just in southern Burley County, just on the east side of the Missouri River, a half dozen miles south of McKinsey. And this is our family, and we're a little bit odd I suppose. My wife Renee's there and and I don't know if it was Jed or Jed's wife or somebody here this morning said top 10, or I think it was actually Deanna, top 10 reasons <clears throat> that we're successful on our ranch and one of them should have been my wife <laughs> and it's the truth but I said she's already got a big head I don't want to tell her anymore <laughs> but it's it's dang sure the truth but anyway my I've got four kids my daughter Shanda on the left my oldest boy, Jeremy, Jay is sitting on the front and then Jay is the youngest on the back. But most places don't have all four of your kids go off to college across the United States, work somewhere, and then want to come home to the ranch. And I'm excited as heck by it all, but man, it creates some issues. How do you fit them in and how do you make it work? And, and uh, we've had to do some things to change that. But, you know, and they think I don't appreciate them enough, but I am so darn proud of what they've done and, and the energy and the excitement that they brought and it reinvigorated me. Or and if any of you were at the Savory tour, you know, Savory was talking up in front and he was, I was standing next to him and he says to me, man, I really admire that your kids all came back. And I said, yeah, you know, if they wouldn't have, I'd probably be laying on the beach in the Caribbean drinking whiskey. And he said, not a bad plan. <laughs> And that's it, true, it's not, but, but it did reinvigorate me and, and it's fun and I don't have a lot of time to spend talking about them and those of you who know me know I can tell lots of stories on them that are fun, but okay, we'll get right into it. And my number one top ten of profitability is holistic management. And Josh Ducart's sitting here and he's a great instructor, there's others I actually took my training from Alan Saver himself and quite honestly I wasn't long after I was out of NDSU and I couldn't even understand it. It was like, you know, and we're taught in black and white a bit and so you've heard me say this and I was like looking for the answer. What's the answer? Just give me the goddamn answer, you know, and I'll do it. You know, and if he just said paint that wall red, I'd have been over the, the paintbrush, you know, because, you know, I. And nothing in life is black and white, and nothing on ranches is black and white. And, and I tell people every day, I don't care if you're ever gonna graze a cow, but go through holistic management, because it teaches you how to think again. And I think we forget how to think. 
And one of the, sorry about that, one of the, uh, this happens to be Savory's tour last year on our place and Alan's up there giving me advice. <laughs> and again, those of you, are, you guys are laughing and Ken Miller understands this, Bonnie, you do as well. On the way there, Savory got in, in the truck with me and he says to me, Jerry, we're here to learn, right? And I said, yeah, we sure are. And he said, it's okay if I criticize you a little bit, I, isn't it? And I said, yeah, that'd be okay. And he stepped out of the truck and he looked around and he said, guys, this is pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, that was a little more than I expected. <laughs> But then he qualified it about, he's come a long way, but he could go so much faster, and I should have been helping him more, and he took the blame, and it was, we had a great day and, and a lot of fun. But one point I'd like to make on holistic management, I don't have time to sit, stand here and harp on all the greatness of it, but one of the principles that's been huge for us, and it was try to get rid of those depreciable assets as much as we can and put our dollars in the land or appreciable things or cattle that can make you money. And so we completely changed our operation from owning a lot of farming type equipment to not owning much. Now you, I'm not dumb enough to know you've got to have some things and so we try to have the things we have, we try to have good stuff. But it made a huge difference in that, you know, we don't get the free caps anymore from the dealers, but we're profitable in it and that's what's important. Okay. Number two, and it goes along with that, is planned rotational grazing. <clears throat> I've always called it intensive grazing. Savory said that's a bad term, so I'm trying to change. <laughs> I don't care what you call it, and that was my point to Savory. I don't really care if we get the term right, I just want to do it right. And it's all about high animal impact, short duration, long recovery periods. We've seen tremendous progress in our natural resources on the, on the land, tremendous improvement in the wildlife on the land, and our profitability has went up because we can run two or three times the cattle that we used to. And it's by rotating cattle every one to seven days. And then it's mimicking what the bison did 200 years ago, or 100 years ago, I should say, when they went through with a couple hundred thousand head and kind of annihilated the land, but they didn't come back for a year or two. And if you read Lewis and Clark's journals, it was abundant, vibrant grasses that were saddle high, they said. And what have we done over years and years of season-long use? We've cut the diversity and changed that whole pattern. So if we get back to planned rotational grazing, and I'm always cautious because I think sometimes some of us are too pushy. You know, oh man, you gotta go to mob grazing right away. You gotta move cattle five times a day. And some of us aren't geared for that. I don't want to live in the pasture, and I, I'm sure some of you don't. And I always tell people, find what works. Find your comfort, and then go with it. And if it's moving cattle once a month, and if you like the progress, and it fits you, and your quality of life is better, then go with it. And then you, you can always change that again. And, and we started, you know, I just took one big pasture after I'd come out of Savory's and split it twice. And I liked what I saw, and, and we've continued to change as time moved on. Okay, and that's just a quick shot of it. It's kind of fuzzy, but of good vibrant grass. This is something I'm proud of, because that's big blue stem grow, going up a just plain sand duty sand hill. We've got some real marginal land. We're off the east side of the Missouri River, and it's sand duty. And when I was a kid, there was no grass on those hills. It was all low sand. But run a lot, a large number of cattle, short duration, and all of a sudden the diversity, and I get people all the time, how'd you plant that? Well, it wasn't planted, that seed bed was there, and I never saw big blue stem out there, and it's covering those sand hills now, and now there's more diversity coming in. So you can really change that whole mix and bring that diversity back, but it's, again, short duration, high density, large numbers, and then long rest and recovery periods. This is just a shot of, of opportunities to do something different. And we took old brown grass pasture that wasn't productive and we went in there and we seeded sizer milk bench into it. If, if you're not familiar with that, it's a non-bloating lagoon and it gives us opportunity in the springtime when our native isn't quite ready to go on some grass that's high productive and, uh, and it's really made a difference and I'm really impressed with this stuff. 
Now, what we did, because it wasn't spread over the whole pasture, but we ran 900 pair in this pasture when it had seed heads, and we ate it to the ground. And I'm hoping those cows spread it all over. And we're starting to see it now, a little patch popping up here and there. And as we get, you know, we've had a couple of kind of weird dry type years, but as we get a little moisture, I think we're going to see some of that pay off, and I'm hoping so. Number three. Concentrate on production per acre. We got to get out of this mindset of production per cow. John, cover your ears because you work for the university. And I'll try not to pick on you guys too hard, but sometimes our model has not worked. And honestly, why don't we have very many young people? And chasing weaning weights has been a broken system that stay near broke a lot of folks. And I chased EPDs for milk and growth and lots of different things and quite honestly I've backed off of most of that and where I find true profitability is starting to concentrate on that whole picture and how many pounds am I producing or how many cattle can I run on that whole operation and don't worry too much about it. and I can't go to the bar and brag about 700 pound weaning weights because it's changed and yeah I'll get neighbors that look at me and they'll yeah, man those are some small calves boy it sure ain't good but when I'm profitable, I really don't give a rip, you know. And it was said earlier, stay out of the bars and the restaurants. And that's true. People are cruel. They'll tear you apart. And if you don't, if you're not strong to stand up to that, you'll cave in. You'll go right back to where you were. So, if you start doing some of these things and not worry about that great weaning weight on on a handful of cows, it's much more important and, and you'll start to see your profitability change number four and jed talked about this quite a bit and it's calving in sync with nature and we calved like a lot of people we calved in a barn and we calved our heifers we started in february and then we moved them to march and calved the cows late march april and you know when i was young that seemed like a lot of fun getting up all night long and pulling calves and screwing around and and then one year I lost 100 calves to scours and you know we were putting all these vaccines and we were chasing all mineral programs trying to find the answer and when you had those it was never you know we'd send a bunch of calves to NDSU and I don't care they came back with multiple pathogens that are killing them but that really wasn't the issue we're putting them under stress and all these issues and really you just had to get back to where you needed to be and that's start paying attention to the deer when do they fawn? It's not in the middle of winter. And when we went, and Jen, you said it, and I've, quote, you, I've said this every time, 20 years ago we changed our calving date. And John, I went to NDSU at the time and I said, give me all the research on late uh, spring or early summer calving there is. I got a half a page. You know, there just wasn't a lot of information out there. And I'm not trying to be critical of NDSU, it just hadn't been looked at because normal was let's calve in february march april whatever and so one day i just had to go over and beat my head against the wall because i said this isn't fun anymore and i either gonna quit because i <clears throat> my dad had passed away my hired man had been with me for years had passed away my boys were screwing off or heading off to college and everything and and i said this isn't fun anymore and we got to do something different and when i changed yeah my calves aren't big but the profitability went just like this. And it's been huge for us. Number one best economic decision I ever made. Get the cattle type right for the system. And when you jump into these, if one day you wake up like me and says, I'm not gonna put any more high inputs into these cows, and you could have a disaster because we don't have the right cattle type. And what have we done in the cattle business, guys? Look at the graph for cow weights. They go just like this. And I was talking to a guy just the other day. He said he is, his neighbor just sold 1,800-pound cows. He had some 2,000-pound cows. In fact, this was a vet that was telling me this. And he said, I was pg in these cows. And I said to him, do you, do you have 1,000-pound calves out here running around? Because, you know, you should be weaning 50% of the body weight. <laughs> and the guy sheepishly, well, no. So why are you keeping them around? You know, and he said, I wasn't trying to be critical, but, and again, I'm never gonna stand up here and tell you what kind of cows to have, and if you can do it with 
2,000 pound cows, I'm going to go, God bless you, and I'm curious how it works. They don't work on my place. I want 1,100 pound cows. I still have some that are too big. Those cows work, and they work for making the most pounds per acre and trying to get the most cows bred and work in this system. My only thing is pay attention to your cow type. Because if you go to this, we've bred the grass ability out of the cattle. And I've custom grazed a lot of yearlings for guys. And I kind of got myself back into grazing more pairs because the, the expectation is too high. These cattle shouldn't go to grass. They're not made to go to grass. They're made to go to the feedlot. And then they want three pounds of gain on grass for them. You can't do it. And then they're mad at you. <clears throat> and give me some moderate frame decent cattle that are made to go to grass and we'll do a good job with them. But that's an issue we have in the cattle industry. I don't see that changing too fast and so and trying to find those right kind of cattle to go buy them is really a challenge. You almost got to raise them because there's not many of them out there. All right. Utilize low maintenance bulls with calving ease and longevity. I, I told you I selected for all these EPD growth and milk traits for years and and actually really screwed my whole power up my opinion these kind of bulls are not that easy to find but there are getting to be more and more of them out there and you can grow your own and we've tried some of that and i'm never very proud of the ones i raise and maybe they're they're right johan johan was mentioned here johan spent a few hours at my place and and <laughs> So I'll make somebody mad here, and that's not my intent. I'm just trying to say some things to get you thinking. But Johan said, go to a bull sale, pick out your top bull sale place, go to them, and then when you're looking through the yard, ask them, what's your poorest bull in the sale? And he said, buy that one, because you're going to get where you need to get quicker than if you bought anything else in that sale. And I'm not saying he's right or wrong, and he was trying to make a point, is we've over-perfected these on traits that we don't they don't work in the grass system anymore and so trying to find these kind of bulls with cavities and longevity longevity we haven't selected for i'm more and more convinced real profitability is in those cows that are 10 12 or 15 years old and yet we don't have many of those in this cattle industry we've got almost like the dairy industry where we're turning them over too fast and that's where the profitability left us too so you got to look for those and they're out there, but uh, and I wouldn't tell you that every bull on my place is what it needs to be yet, but we've got a lot of them that are, and I think we're moving in the right direction. I can spend a whole hour or two or three on regenerating soil health. I can show you a lot of data on our ranch that we've tested to really improve the rangeland and the cropland. I just want to tell you, anything you move in that direction is going to help your profitability. It's hard to measure right away, but over the long term, you're going to start to bring that resource back. You're going to start to cut your inputs, and we've proven it on our ranch, where we can have 20 species cover crop, keep our four crop types in our rotation, use planned grazing, and then come back with, with cash crops on that and not utilize any fertilizer on there because we've got the biology working and we're growing our own inputs and not having to put them in. That's where profitability starts to really come in. And then I always say, is building soil health worth a dollar an acre or is it a thousand? We haven't quantified it very well, but I would tell you, I think it's closer to the higher end than the lower end. And as we get to quantify that, and if we're truly into trying to protect our resource, that's where we need to be. Now there's a lot of agriculture that hasn't bought into this yet. You're here because you're buying in or you're at least questioning and you're asking, what can we do different? But a lot of mainstream agriculture, and they're my friends, don't get this wrong. I'm not trying to criticize anybody. They're just trying to make ends meet and do what they think's right. But they're into high input, high, re high return with small margin. But I think long term, this is gonna become a big deal as we get more and more pressure from the consuming public and, and uh, I can talk about that a little bit later because we bring a lot of people to the ranch but okay number eight utilize no-till you know we've been no-tailing for over 20 some years now 
I don't know why it took me so long to figure that out. When I sat on the, as the chairman of the State Board of Ag Research, no-till was just kind of, it had been around, but it was just being talked about quite a bit at NDSU and research, and I'm like, I don't get the buzz. I, you know, I was, I was a skeptic, I guess. And, and when I finally did it, I'm like, my God, how could I be so stupid? You know, in our marginal soils, it's made huge difference for us in limiting the runoff and improving the infiltration. We just don't run water down the hill anymore. And the bigger thing is evaporation. And I, I'll run out of time, but I'm going to tell this one story really quick because. And Josh, you've heard me tell this 50 times, but it's one of those, you have these aha moments where you really get it on soil health, and it's one that there was a researcher from Australia at the ranch who walked out in a 20 species cover crop, and it was 95 degrees outside. Cover crop was this tall, and she pulled the soil from under it, she stuck it in the ground, and it was 68 degrees. And I went, aha. Because at 70 degrees, the biologic activity in the soil is at its maximum, and at 70 degrees, 100% of the water is going to the plant. And our problem in these traditional farming is you're evaporating it all, and the biology is dead, and that's why we have to put all these inputs in. And that, from that moment on, I really got this. And it's never perfect and will never be exactly where we want to be, but the more and more we work with it, the smarter we get. And, and we'll keep moving ahead. That just shows, this is after we graze covered crops in the winter, that's what the litter looks like. That's what we'll plant a cash crop into. Ground 100% covered, keeps the soil temperature down, keeps the moisture where it belongs, and we'll just no-till right into that. That's what our soil looked like this spring. Jay Fear was out, we pulled these samples. Soil experts have told me on our sandier marginal soil, it's really hard to get worms. Your husband, Mark, we've had this discussion because those grits are like glass. When we pulled this up this spring, I was, I, I don't, I don't know, there's something wrong with me. I never used to get excited about worms. <laughs> but I was, I thought, man, there's something happening here. And you can see the porousness of the soil, all of a sudden we're starting to see that come around. The organic matter is going up, the biology is going up, the porousness of the soil is improving, and we've got all those worms in that soil, and I'm like, wow, we're moving in the direction we want to go, and that's going to improve profitability. This is a huge one for us. Get rid of winter feed as much as you can. And for years, you know, we did what everybody else did. You spent the whole day in the winter time feeding cattle. And I mean, it was somewhat fun, I guess, until something broke down or, or uh, like uh, the fairies when they show that picture of that cabless tractor. I remember those days. That isn't fun. But when we started with cover crops, and we had a little trouble with cover crops early on, but we said, what do we want to do with them? And we've got a three-tier goal. Number one, get rid of those winter feed costs or cut them back as much as we can. Number two, rebuild soil health on really depleted ground that had been farmed out for years and years and years. And number three, propagate the wildlife. They've worked excellent on all of them. But this is what we do. We plant full season cover crops, 20 some species, all the, I can't go into all that, I don't have time, but all the things that cover the spectrum on species. And we've went through several years without feeding a bale of hay of our cows. And in a normal year, it's $200 savings per cow. $200 is a lot. And that's taken off the land charge. That's taken off the cover crop charge. And because Bismarck State College Farm and Ranch Management analyzed the data. So $200 heads a lot if you're trying to bring the next generation back, you're trying to stay in business and, and keep going. And then you're building the soil health and propagating the wildlife on top of it. It's huge for us now. You have to have a backup plan. This is the winter before last. And we've, we've grazed through 200 year snowfalls, but it didn't come all at once. And they, those cows would plow through and they'd work. Two years ago, we had 75 inches all just about within two weeks, three weeks time. And we had four major blizzards and we lost some cattle and it was ugly. And you've got to have a backup plan. And my kids finally got it because we were sitting on this hay we hadn't used and we had to use it. 
and we hauled it out. We never bring those cattle in anymore. We never put them in that drainage area that ends up in the Missouri River like we used to and feed on for years and years. They stay out there. We'll unroll some out there if we need to. This was, we were able to graze clear up till the end of that first week in January, and they were digging through and they were getting it. And then we were had to feed for until about March 1st or so, we were able to go back. So it was still a huge saving, but we didn't save the $200. Last winter, we just saved 400 because hay was so high. But I had to peel 100 off because my cover crops weren't so good because of the drought. And so I peeled 100 off, but I saved 300. That's huge. I don't care if you've got 100 cows or 5,000, $300 adds up in a hurry and keeps that profitability up here where we want it to be. And the other thing I didn't mention, but it was on my first slide, and then that quality of life. And two of my major goals in holistic management are improve the profitability and improve the quality of life, because I think we miss them most of the time, and I know I did for a big chunk of my early life. All right, and I'm gonna run out of time, about five minutes or so. You've got your 145. Oh, I do, okay. So slow down, we're going 100 miles an hour. <laughs> All right, oh, thanks. And, and some time for questions as well. Another thing for profitability is find some niches, whatever they may be. And you know, we're so entrenched and we get so busy looking at things in a blinder that you can't see anything. And I, I was the same way. And I'm convinced that every one of us in here has an unfair advantage over the rest of us of some sort. What is that? I can't tell you and you may not see it, but you gotta think about it and look and maybe have some other folks look. In our case, it was the airport in Bismarck. I never got that, but we're 25 miles away from that airport and, and with our hunting operation, with our agritourism venture, all those, most of those folks fly. And that's a huge advantage to us. And I never would have guessed that in a million years. And I never would have guessed 10 years ago we'd be doing what we're doing today. But it's caused my kids to be involved in our profitability to go just like this. So it, my challenge to you is look for where the niche might be. And there's, I'm a real optimist on agriculture. I don't think we've ever had so much opportunity and potential. Now saying that, there's a tremendous amount of risk and it's not simple. You know, Mother Nature is a pain in the hind end. Government agencies and regulations and all those things are a pain. The whole political system that drives you crazy and, and you know, the urban outreach, all those things. But I think there's so many niches that we can fit into and find. This is our Grand Lodge and, and, and an, Rolling Plains Adventures, my oldest boy, when he came back from NDSU, we established that. And we were swamped right now with hunters. And But you meet a lot of great people, and the fun of it for me is I get to hear all their things about beef industry and consumers and their perceptions. And so it, it really drives me. Just a quick shot of a pheasant hunt. And, you know, pheasants are down, but we, but we plant a lot of cover crops and a lot of food plots. Pheasants are good on on our place and I'm not trying to brag but we we work hard to make sure our wildlife population stay good this is our when Jay came back Jay was the rebel he's the one that didn't go to a land grant he went to Arizona State the number one party school in the nation they told me according to Playboy and Josh told me that I never looked at that book but Josh told me about that <laughs> anyway when Jay came back, he worked for Anheuser-Busch and had it made, and he, he said, we've got, we already had five lodges on the ranch, and we had this infrastructure, and he said, I think we can go into agritourism and bring corporate events and other things into the ranch and spread a positive image on agriculture, because not enough people are talking about it. And so he talked me out of this barn, which it took him a while, because I didn't want to lose it, and yet I finally said, I can't stand in the way of progress. And if these younger kids want to be a part of this, I just can't stand in their way. And so the, the old parts on that end, this is the newer part. This was actually the savory event out there. And so we get an opportunity to talk to lots of people about lots of stuff. And the one thing I never dreamt we'd be in, and this whole thing takes goes like this, is weddings. And it was just by accident, Jay did his wedding at the ranch and people 
that were there said, hey, would you do one for us? And we did a couple in a tent and then built the barn. And now we have a wedding every weekend all summer long until hunting season comes because we can't double up things and so we have to stop them. And it's, it's challenging but exciting and fun and it, it brings the kids in and, and my daughter who's not directly involved in the operation does all the cooking for the hunting. She's the wedding planner that you had to have a woman to deal with the mother of the bride and she had to be. <laughs> so it, it fits together and, and allows for some fun. We're also into this grass-finished beef, and you've heard quite a bit about it. We're not near where we want to be. I think there's some huge opportunity. We're in the pilot program of the, of the Audubon Bird Friendly Beef Program. I'm really excited about that program. Now, there's some super big challenges, but when a wildlife group comes to ranchers and says, how do we design a program that benefits you and helps birds, that was exciting to me. And Marshall Johnson and, and the other folks at Audubon, Lucy, that's around here somewhere, have done a tremendous job. Now, they've got some issues, because we don't have any packing that's worth a darn, and this is no disrespect to the few plants we have left, but we don't have many that are state inspected or federal inspected, so there's issues. And we're, several of us, we've talked about that in the side conversation today, it's hard. But I think, again, there's huge opportunity. It's the fastest growing segment of the beef industry. It'll probably never take over corn-fed beef, and I don't think we should ever attempt that. And I don't like, because I heard a guy on the radio the other day, and he's a grass finisher, and he's bad-mouthing the rest of the beef industry. I think that's risky. I don't want us to go down that path. I think we need to sell it on the positives that it has and not try to kill each other in the process. Because what it does, and I know this firsthand from the people that visit the ranch, it confuses the consumer. And if you're confused, what do you do? And I watch people at the meat counter buy chicken because it's simple. It's got a recipe right on it. You get all the legs or all breasts or whatever in the beef industry. As much as we've done with checkoffs and things, we're still antiquated in what we have out there for information, I think, and at the meat counter. So again, I think some huge opportunity. We're exploring that. We're doing some things. We'll see where that goes. This is where my youngest son, who just graduated Montana State, and he's the cowboy of the family and, and loves the cattle industry. And every one of them, I said, if you come back, you've got to find your niche. And how do you add value? And Jeremy did the hunting operation. Jay did the agritourism. Tourism. Now Jace is trying to change the whole way we do livestock and things on the ranch. So it's exciting and fun, but challenging. We're big into custom grazing. I only throw this out here because it's another niche, particularly young people. I never would have said this 20 years ago because I had to own everything. It was just the way it was entrenched in me. You had to own every cow, own every combine, own every pickup, everything. My boys taught me a different way. We custom graze a lot of cattle. It's a way we spread our risk and it's a way we can improve our land with multiple uh, herds and, and yearlings and things by using somebody else's cattle. We still have our own cow herd and and the balance of that, I can't even get my boys to agree on what that balance should be and I'm kind of in the middle like, I like the diversity. Let's keep both lines open and see where it goes. I think it's a good option that again can increase profitability. When this cattle market is, you know, when the cattle market was really good, I should own them all. And when the cattle market's really poor, I should own none. And somewhere in the middle is the right balance but having that to protect your profitability in year in and year out and not take you into the doldrums as we hit the peak of this cattle market is very important and can really help with profitability. We're doing some experimenting with multi-species. I've been around the country speaking a lot. Dr. Teague in Texas told me at a seminar you could run six sheep for every cow with no detrimental effects. I'm like, man, that's a lot of sheep. <laughs> and Texas is different in North Dakota in that I think there's more brush and things. But, you know, John, you probably have a number better than I do, but even if it's one or two, that could be a huge income stream. And for me, the bigger part of this is improving the rangeland. I've proven to myself, I can take the selectivity out of these cattle with intensive grazing, but I'll take their performance away if I'm not careful, and I've done that. And so I have to be careful. 
But the sheep in there could help that and improve that rangeland and take some of those species out that we can't get unless we take the selectivity away. Now what we did, and these are hair sheep, and we just tried to see if we could find these cattle and these sheep. And it was a bit of a challenge for the first half of the year, but they're bound now. Those 20 sheep do not leave those cattle. And I, don't, I didn't put any different fence in. You know, and early in the year, I had them in a neighbor's garden, and that wasn't good. <laughs> and so we had to get through some of that, but now they're good. Now, I don't know if I'm ready to go out and buy a few hundred yet or not, but trying to learn, trying to see, trying to see where it goes, and, and I just throw it out there. I, I, I'm really convinced this multi-species grazing makes some sense. And here's a little different multi-species, but we're, we're in a buffalo business a bit. And we jumped into this because we've got some pretty rough train on the south end of the ranch and, and some of our hunting clients want to hunt buffalo. And so my oldest boy said, hey, I think this may be an opportunity. And then Jay said, yeah, and I think we could fit these into the meat thing. And where these buffalo fit that the cattle don't, these aren't domestic animals. They don't fit by all the rules that we have on slaughter on cattle. And so where that goes, I don't know yet, but we're having fun. and. Jay, you talked about 100, wasn't it you that talked about 100% chaff crop or somebody today? That's the first time I ever had 100% was these buffalo and I never looked at them. So I'm like, hey, this ain't all bad. So, you know, if that's the answer or not, and I'm just throwing these out, just ideas, just thoughts, and, and it's more about find your niche, find your thing, find what might work, find what is exciting and brings profitability to your ranch. And, and we're constantly looking at that, and that's the fun of three really invigorated boys that are constantly thinking and I'm sometimes like oh my I'm running out of energy here but but it reinvigorated in me and made it fun again and my last thing as I wrap this up is and I think we missed this have fun I watch too many people that just aren't having fun and believe me I'm old enough to go through the 80s and the guys that I admired the most you know none of them are with us and they didn't die, they went broke. And I, I was telling John Lee Naza earlier, Chad, that you know, I thought it was cool back then if you had 10 Steigers lined up in a shop. I thought, man, that guy's really got me. But them guys ain't here, you know? And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. It's, and I don't want to see anybody go down that path. We don't have enough producers. We have, we're struggling with young people in the business. Let's be smarter. But let's have fun with it. I watch too many guys, friends of mine that are my neighbors, the next quarter comes up for rent or sale and they grab it because that's what they should do and then they bitch about it the whole time. I hate what I do. I hate this. I'm Kevin in February. You, that Facebook thing you had was perfect, Jed. I, that's an issue we have. But it's not often we're all together at one place on horseback and, and uh, so it's just a great shot and, and fun to have fun. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate being here today. That was kind of a whirlwind thing of, of 10 things that I think make sense. There's lots of offshoots in that. And I just encourage you to have an open mind in some of this and think. We bring a lot of people to the ranch through tours or tourism or whatever. And too many times I've watched somebody, well, that works here, and they might only be 50 miles away, but it won't work there. And I'm like, you kind of missed it, didn't you? I mean, I'm not saying it will work perfectly. The principles are the same. You have to adapt them to your own scenario or own operation. So with that, anybody have any questions or thoughts or Challenge me, tear me apart. I'm good. That was pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Go hug your wagon. <laughs> That's an inside joke, guys. <laughs> A few of you get it. <laughs> Jerry. Yes, sir. The grass fed thing, after listening to our right? talk, I went, you know, that's going to get some traction, but out here with the processing. Yep. Well, that's a challenge, John, and this processing thing, I don't have figured out, you know, we've got the new little plant Schweitzer's done, they're great people, I love these people to death, and they're state inspected, but only on the slaughter end, 
and it caught some of us off guard. I didn't even know you could do that until I found out we had some beef process and I couldn't sell it because it's not state inspected on the packaging side. And I didn't even know you could split that. You maybe did, but. Uh, are you thinking of online mail meet or how do we access the okay. consumer over here? Is there some channels that right. are opening up? Or? Well, I think all of those. In our case, we put 10,000 people through our ranch last year through events and through hunting and through, they all want to buy beef off that ranch and I can't give it to them and that's a shame, isn't it? And so how do I do that? And that's what intrigued me and that, that's not the only market. I do think we've got to go online. And in my case, I'm convinced the beef has to be decent, but I don't think that's really what sells it. We have to sell the story. And in the case of us, it's selling the story of conservation, of regenerating natural resources, of keeping the beauty, of protecting our riparian areas, of protecting those streams and rivers. And I, can, I think I can sell that because when I talk to these people, they, they're buying into that. They really are this, this, the young, my kids' generation. That's why food co-ops and the one in Bismarck are successful. It's, it's selling that story. Now it's not easy because we don't have the packing. We were having some discussions here last night and Lucy, Lucy's with Audubon of, should we be going to the state? Should we be trying to change the law? Should we, you know, so we can do more because they're convoluted on this beef stuff, you know? And, and uh, you know, if you're selling, slaughtering in South Dakota, then you can't bring it back. And it makes no sense. And and you guys may or may not know this, but you know, over 30 months of age, and, and these older heifers or cows, they're the ones that are really working. But then the mad cop kicks in, you can't put a T-bone in it. But how stupid that rule is, all you gotta do is take to the inspector your calving date on a piece of paper. And then, oh, okay, the T-bones can go in now. Well, you know, I just, you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, it's just, we wonder why we can't be successful, why young people get frustrated and go, my God, it's easier to go to work for Cargill or Tim, you know, wherever, where we don't have to put up with this nonsense. So I think it's, people like you here have got to stand up and if it's, if it's rule changes that need to be or whatever it might be. Now the Buffalo thing, you can process with a portable unit. There's a guy in South Dakota come, he'll, He'll slaughter 30 head of buffalo in your pasture. You can't do that in the beef thing yet. That would help. And maybe that's a real change we need somehow. Like, again, I think there's tremendous opportunity for niches and maybe it's just growing beef for some medicinal type thing. And, and, and maybe John, it's just you as a producer or you as a producer and it's a small deal, but you work this out. But we've got to get through some of these these challenges. You know, there's some guys that are selling to markets and things, but gosh, they're hauling their cattle a long way. They're trying to make it work, and, and I think some are. So, no easy answers. I mean, I'm kind of looking to the, you know, the big guys in the extension, figure this all out for us. <laughs> Might be late for <laughs> Other questions? Thoughts? Anything? Well, if not, thanks so much. It's been fun. Appreciate it.